All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Friends, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could only learn to stop worrying? You and I know how futile it is to fuss and fret. And nine times out of ten, when we ask ourselves, why are we so worked up? We can't put our finger on any definite reason or on any incident in our lives that started what we call a worry pattern of thought. Why then do we worry? Jesus said, take no anxious thought for the morrow. And then he added that there is a truth which can set you free from the need to worry about anything. And now modern science and our new religious outlook are doing more to help us overcome our worries today than ever before. For science is showing us why worry, why we worry, and religion is teaching us why we need not worry. This should mean a great deal to us because everyone worries about something. At the same time that everyone worries about something, very few people indeed know how it is that worry works. Most people, and this seems surprising, most people have no idea what causes their worries. For example, an accomplished architect is asked to do a drawing for a new building. Now he is a man of experience and a man of achievement. But when he is assigned to this new job, he begins to worry about it. When he realizes that he is being anxious, he stops and reasons within himself, pointing out to himself that this job is not unlike others that he has done and done successfully. He has a good background. He has years of successful experience. Technically and professionally, he is sure of himself, but still he worries. And here is a salesman who has an appointment with a client, and he is anxious about the meeting. He thinks to himself, I have something to sell and something that I have complete confidence in. The person I am meeting is just like other people I have talked to. I know how to present my ideas all right, but still I am worried. Now in these two illustrations, this important factor is revealed. There is no apparent reason why either one of these people should be worried, or if there is a reason, they both are unconscious of it. And this leads to an important conclusion, which is that most of the things we worry about have no relationship to our worrying. In the case of the architect, the assignment of the new job the fact that he was anxious about it must stand as two separate things if we are to understand the nature of his worry and if we are to arrive at a place where he can overcome it. He must understand that these two factors really have no relationship at all to his worry. Therefore, we are led to this conclusion, and we now know that anxiety is rarely related to what we are now doing but anxiety arises out of certain mental tendencies that we are no longer aware of. The question then comes up, where does worry come from? How did it get here in the first place? And let's see what modern science has to offer to explain where our worries come from. It is now generally agreed that worry is a thought pattern. We can all understand this because we are acquainted with patterns, whether they be patterns for making a dress or for making a cake, or whether they are plans for a house. Psychology also tells us that these anxiety thought patterns, as they are called, were acquired either in infancy or in early childhood. Usually, they were imposed on us by well-meaning but poorly informed adults, 
through such simple ways as saying, you can't do this, or you can't do that, or you're a bad boy, or you're a bad girl, you're no good, and on and on. These statements of rejection and condemnation were repeated so many times that the infant mind accepted them as the truth about itself. And this negative idea became by way of illustration like a stained glass window through which the rays of light are to be filtered and conditioned throughout the rest of his life. That is, unless the negative thought patterns are dissolved. Today, when you and I worry, it is because we are seeing a present situation that is colored by the mental stained glass windows of many years ago. In other words, because worry or anxiety thought patterns exist within us, we attach them to the conditions at hand. Actually, because worry is an inner condition, the architect, if he had not had a new assignment at all about which to worry, he would have found something else to attach his inner condition of anxiety to. It is exactly like a monotonous tune being played over and over in the mind, one from which he couldn't seem to free himself. But now we know that these worry patterns can be healed, and there is greater hope today for the anxious heart than there ever has been before in the history of mankind. Let's not accept this lightly. It is important that each of us overcome his anxieties and his fears, for they certainly are most undesirable companions. They are enemies that strike in two devastating ways. Anxiety attacks our bodies as well as our minds. And behind most cases of high blood pressure and heart disease, there is an insistent worry and anxiety. It is interesting to see just how this works. When we begin to express our anxiety, our muscles contract. And when our muscles contract, less space is provided for the flow of the blood, and so the blood vessels become crowded. When this happens, the heart works harder to pump the body, body, the blood through the circulatory system. And this overworks the heart, strains it. It may even cause a damage which could end in a heart attack. Now, on the other hand, if anxiety expresses itself in our mental activities rather than our physical bodies, then we see a crippling of the mental attitudes. The person becomes what is called a defeatist. He becomes fearful sometimes of the most normal situations in life. Frequently, he loses control of his emotions and thoughts concerning the simplest activities. This, carried to an extreme degree, is what is called an anxiety neurosis. Well, most of us are not concerned with an anxiety that has grown to the place where it really has crippled the body or the mind. But all of us are concerned with a garden variety of anxiety. The thing that torments us in little ways, in everyday activities. And so let's do something about it. And let's do it right now. And let our healing begin by looking at a mental principle which all too often we have ignored. In infancy, an anxiety pattern was established in the subconscious mind. But the fact that it was established there is not nearly as important as the fact that it could be established. For there is nothing in the subconscious that hasn't been put there. Therefore, there is nothing there that cannot be changed. We may have put it there unconsciously. We probably didn't even know that we were doing it. But we can consciously remove it. It is very important for us to remember that there is always some kind of a subconscious reaction to our thoughts. The unconscious mind can be thought of as a receptacle, a vessel, 
into which we pour our thoughts and dreams, our desires and our feelings. And all of these thoughts fall into the subconscious and hold their patterns on the face of the mirror of our mind. In all our thinking, we are making patterns in this mirror of life. These patterns condition all our activities and thoughts until the patterns themselves become changed. And now this offers a challenge to each one of us. It makes us careful of our thinking. It shows us the importance of directing our thoughts in such a way as to put a new kind of pattern on life's mirror, a new kind of tendency in the subconscious. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for all of our activities if they could be conditioned by the pattern of faith instead of distorted by patterns of fear and patterns of worry and disease? For every man's mind is like a mirror, a mirror reflecting outwardly those things that are dominant in his thoughts. So it has been written that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And now science has explained the reason why, and modern religion tells us what we can do about it. There is before us now the conscious use of a practical faith that endows us with a creative power that each of us can use to heal himself of the scourge of anxiety. When we stop, when we consciously realize that all that life is, is right where we are, we can come to a place of certainty in our minds where we no longer feel that we are lacking. There is but one life, which is God, God the power greater than we are, and each of us is an expression of this one life. Nothing is more certain in the universe than the infinite presence of God. And when we are conscious of this infinite presence, then its certainty will be reflected in everything we do. It will be reflected in our attitudes toward work and toward people and toward ourselves. Life is sufficient unto itself. God lacks nothing. God needs nothing. God is all there is, everywhere present. And if uh, through our faith we could capture this vision and hold it as a pattern before the mirror of our mind, then it would automatically follow that we should become confident and courageous instead of being timid and afraid. But before we can do this, we must come sincerely and simply to believe that there is a power greater than we are and that we can use it. We must come to believe that this thing called life desires only what is good for us. This is all it has ever planned. All of these other things that have so unhappily been lodged in our mind, they were put there by fear and ignorance and doubt. This fear and uncertainty, which has so burdened us, has been based on the lack of a realization that everyone has a silent partner, a partner that accompanies him throughout life. Trouble is he has been trying to go entirely on his own and alone, so to speak. And right here is where faith must enter. Because it makes no difference how much we know about the laws of mind, it isn't enough just to know that our minds are mirrors reflecting our inward thoughts into our everyday living. What we need to add to this is something that spiritual conviction alone can ever give us. What is it that we are reflecting? And here is something good for us to know. Before ever we reflected a neurotic pattern of any kind, we first reflected a divine pattern, a pattern that was whole and complete, a pattern that is still with us, 
and will always be with us. This pattern is in no way subject to the limitations of time or to the sequence of events. It is the eternal here, the everlasting now. It is the God who has never deserted his creation. Well, someone may say, so you're trying to lead us back to religion. No, I am not trying to lead anyone anywhere. I am merely pointing out some facts. Man is rooted in pure spirit, in perfect life. And he will be freed from fear and doubt and worry only when he finds a faith and a confidence and a conviction something greater than his former limitation. For every fear, we must find a faith, and we must substitute certainty for uncertainty. Just put this to work and see what happens. Say to yourself, there is something within me that is never afraid, no matter what the appearance may be. There is something within me that is never anxious, for it knows that everything is all right in spite of my feeble worries. Say to yourself and mean it, I am endowed with courage and confidence. I face life with the seed of victory in my mind. Know that as you go forward from this point, life holds only the best for you. And even as you begin to think and to move in such a direction, you will discover blessing in all that you do. Blessings greater than you might have dared to dream while you stood quaking before the ghosts of your former years. Yes, faith is the only complete answer to our worries. Faith in something greater than we are. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I am more than grateful for all your expressions of appreciation for the lessons we have been sending you. I think it would, it would do all of you good if you could only read our mail. It would make you so happy to know how many people actually are putting these lessons into practice. Here is a letter from one writer which says, the, lessening, the lessons are opening new horizons for me, and I look forward to them eagerly. I earnestly hope that your Sunday broadcast will become nationwide. Well, you may be certain that we hope so too. Here is another letter that says, Your lesson on the law of attraction, I have loaned to a friend who would like a copy. She would like to be put on your mailing list together with my daughter and myself. Then she adds that her daughter is reading this lesson every day. And already she has been able to make very practical use of it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a million people could be studying these lessons and applying them? Well, this is exactly what we want to happen. And I want to thank all of you for your kindness in writing us, for your expressions of appreciation, and for the blessing that you have been sending us. May this blessing come back to each one of you, and may it come back multiplied a thousand times. In a moment, Dr. Holmes will bring you his meditation for today. 
But first, we are happy to say that during the last few weeks, many thousands of listeners have written in to ask for the lessons in Dr. Holmes' second home study course. On cards and in letters, many of you have expressed your gratitude for the opportunity of securing this splendid course on how to use the power for good. This week, you may secure lesson three in this new series of 12 lessons by writing to This Thing Called Life, Los Angeles 5. Lesson three is entitled, How Spirit Manifests Through Man. In this instructive lesson, Dr. Holmes tells you that spirit is the source of power and that the law of mind obeys the voice of spirit. Send for lesson three without fail this week. Study it carefully. Use the meditation at the close of the lesson to help you to achieve a greater spiritual understanding of how you may use the power for good in the universe. Remember this week, a letter or a penny postcard addressed to This Thing Called Life, Los Angeles 5, will bring you lesson three in Dr. Holmes' second home study course, absolutely free. Be sure to enroll in this new series of 12 lessons without fail this week. Let us take as the thought for our meditation today these words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And let us see if we cannot find the assurance that comes from conscious communion with that spirit in which we live and move and have our being, as each says quietly to himself. I am now established in the presence of infinite good. The life of God is my life right now. The mind of God is my mind right now. I open my heart to the influx of spirit and I know that the love that floods my being heals my body and dispels every shadow of doubt and fear and anxiety. The truth of my spiritual being sets me free from the bondage of ignorance. Divine intelligence directs my thoughts and my path that I may move into life's activities with a calm and poise and assurance that never wavers. I dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I rejoice in the divine companionship of the infinite spirit which sustains me in all that I do. All that the Father hath is mine. This I accept. This I express. 